Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the debut edition of Wow Frost Wow, dedicated to co-creator Mark Frost and inspired by the triumphant release of Twin Peaks, the final dossier. A friendly warning to everyone who isn't caught up on all of Twin Peaks, including the material from the final dossier, there will be spoilers in this video, so viewers and listeners be warned. So having just recently finished reading Frost's new book, I thought it was excellent and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It did an outstanding job of filling many of the long gaps between seasons two and three. And it also touched on some moments we did see from both of those seasons with much greater depth and clarity. The book is rich with details and specifics, and I think it successfully enhances the overall Twin Peaks experience. So I would definitely recommend it to any fellow die-hard fans of Twin Peaks. It provides an awful lot of information about an awful lot of characters, and while it does spell some stuff out that may have otherwise been left up to interpretation, at the same time, it still acts as a springboard for many new questions, and it also acts to enhance some of the already awesome existing mysteries. The most interesting aspect for me was the amplified confirmation of the alternate timeline, beyond knowing that Pete Martell got to go fishing. It all started with the aftermath of Freddy's battle with Bob at the sheriff's station, when Cole and Cooper somehow wound up at the boiler room of the Great Northern, and we learned that Agent Cooper disappeared without a trace for the second time in 25 years. While perusing past editions of the Twin Peaks Post, Agent Tammy Preston decided to explore information from the first time Cooper vanished. Tammy was shocked to read that Cooper had first arrived in town to aid in the investigation into the disappearance, still unsolved, of Laura Palmer. Holy shit. So we knew that Cooper saved Laura and changed the past, creating an alternate timeline of events. But now we have some new facts to work with, beyond the fact that Pete finally got to go fishing. Number one, we learned that Cooper still arrived in Twin Peaks. A few episodes back, I had assumed that if Laura never died, that Cooper would never arrive in Twin Peaks. But I was wrong. He apparently did still arrive in Twin Peaks, and it also appears he still vanished under similar mysterious circumstances. Number two. We learn that the investigation into Laura's disappearance is ongoing. It's still pending. It was never solved. No body was ever found. So we are further led to believe that Carrie Page is indeed the real Laura Palmer in the alternate timeline. Number three. We learn that when Tammy asked the sheriff's station team about Laura, they were all seemingly mesmerized and confused in some type of a dazed fog. Eventually, they finally each agreed that, yes, that's what happened. Laura's disappearance sounded right to them, and that was the way they remembered it. Number four. We learned the disappearance investigation was similar to the murder investigation in terms of the last people who were known to see Laura. Bobby Briggs, James Hurley, Leo Johnson, and Jacques Renault. But no useful information ever came from any of them. Number five, we learn that Laura wandered off in the woods before going with Ronette, Leo, and Jacques to the train car. Ronette was still taken captive and escaped, where she was still subsequently found walking aimlessly around near the train trestle. More on Ronette's reported account later. Number six, we learn that Laura's case went cold after about a month and there are some references in the papers at the time regarding Cooper's brief appearance in the town when he was helping to aid the investigation into Laura's disappearance. Number seven, we learn that Leland Palmer committed suicide on the one-year anniversary of Laura's disappearance. He killed himself with a licensed handgun, alone, inside his car parked near the waterfall. Number eight, it is strongly suggested that Sarah Palmer was the lovely young lass who swallowed the frogger moth. Preston found reports from Sarah's childhood regarding the AM station that was viciously attacked on August 6, 1956. There were sightings of creepy woodsmen on that night, 
the airwaves were hacked, and many people blacked out when they heard these transmissions. Sarah was one of two people from her neighborhood suffering such consequences. Number nine, Sarah Palmer is said to have battled alcoholism, addiction to prescription pills, and social isolation, at least in the timeline where Leland had committed suicide. Also in the alternate version, around the time Cooper disappeared again, Sarah was named and questioned as an eyewitness in the gruesome death of the scumbag sporting the truck you shirt. Number 10. Tammy is awfully glad she wrote all this down for Cole, as her memories of the original timeline begin fading away, like those of the Twin Peaks residents before her. So what does all this mean? For starters, I think this strongly implies that everything we saw of Sarah from Season 3 was from the alternate timeline. Meaning every time we saw Sarah, this was in the timeline where Laura never died, but rather went missing. So when Sarah is watching violent nature shows, when she's freaking out inside the liquor store, when she's acting all types of spooky when chatting with Hawk, while she's watching the looping boxing match, and when she bites the throat of the truck you scumbag, all of this, I think, was supposed to be in the alternate timeline. And the last part was supposed to have happened around the time Cooper disappeared again. All of this seems to correspond with when Cooper went back and changed the past. As you see here, when the shot turned from black and white to color, exhibiting a transition from the past into a new present. And then Sarah freaks out and smashes the picture of Laura, where Sarah was seemingly affected in the present and not in the past, like when Pete finally got to go fishing. But wait a minute, if all that happened in the alternate timeline, then why was the door answered by that Tremont woman? And who was that Tremont really talking to off screen? Was that Sarah? We did hear Sarah's voice echoing before Carrie Page began screaming. What the hell is going on here? Is the fact that we have a Tremont appearance and a Chalfont reference in the same scene the big clue that this isn't just some new random homeowner, that this is directly connected to Lodge entities, and that even though Cooper doesn't know what year it is, maybe he wasn't as totally clueless as he first appeared. After all, Jeffrey tells Agent Cooper where to find Judy, and if it wasn't for the trickery and deceit of the fireman, Bad Coop would have reached a Palmer residence had the giant not intervened. And what do we make of the fact that we essentially got confirmation that Sarah was the lovely young lass who swallowed the frogger moth? Oh, goodness. That's a huge game changer, and I'm not entirely sure what to make of it. But at this point, I'm inclined to believe that the frogger moth was a prerequisite for her subsequent possession. Meaning, I tend to believe the frogger moth wasn't the point of possession, but rather, the point that would someday make possession possible. Let's go back to Ronette and the fact that her account is different from what we saw in Part 17, and it's also different than what we saw in Fire Walk With Me. Here's the excerpt from Agent Tamara Preston. The next day, Ronette Pulaski, the girl who had been abducted and nearly killed along with Laura, and who had apparently still been taken captive escaped and ended up in the hospital after being found wandering along a railroad trestle just like before. But she also testified that Laura had wandered off into the woods before she and Leo and Jacques had entered the railroad car. Hmm. In part 17, Laura never met up with that trio because Cooper intercepted Laura while they were waiting. And in Fire Walk With Me... Leo and Jacques never entered the train car. They had been with Laura at the cabin along with Ronette, but Leland was the one who forcibly escorted the ladies to the train car. So this has me thinking back to when we saw Ronette's likeness in the realm of non-existence. Or am I maybe reading too much into the wording of Ronette's account here? Perhaps Ronette and or the reporter were experiencing the transition of fading memories at that time? Or maybe Mike played some greater role in all of this, given the fact he was chasing Laura around with that green ring. 
Then finally, we have the fact that Laura Palmer never died. So I'm continuing to assume that Carrie Page is indeed Laura Palmer from the alternate timeline created by Cooper meddling in affairs he can't even begin to understand. Whether Carrie Page was deliberately lying to Cooper and trying to keep her cover, or whether she had completely repressed and forgotten her old traumatizing memories, or whether she simply suffered some bout of amnesia, or any combination of these things, we could safely assume that Laura is Carrie, and that this isn't some type of tulpa or doppelganger thing at play here. But it sure would be interesting to learn about Laura's life in this alternate timeline. What happened to her from the time she disappeared from Cooper's grasp up until the point when Cooper arrived at her door? It must have been some really crazy shit along the way based on what we do know. And what we know is that she's a woman who seems to be every bit as troubled now as she was during her tragic troubled youth. Carrie has a dead guy with a hole in his head on her couch. Carrie seems to have been waiting for law enforcement to find some guy when Cooper arrived at her door, and Carrie gets all agitated and paranoid when she mistakenly thinks her and Cooper were being followed. So people's memories of Laura dying are fading and being replaced, or have faded and already been replaced, with memories that Laura had disappeared and gone missing. People are baffled in a way that doesn't sound all that much different than what we saw at the diner when Bing was asking for Billy. Even Tammy Preston herself admits she is losing her grasp on the unofficial version. But we know, according to Philip Jeffries, that Gordon Cole will remember the unofficial version. I'm not sure why Cole will remember the unofficial version, but I am confident that if and when Twin Peaks continues... This will be a huge factor in things yet to come in the story. I haven't even begun to scratch the surface here, but in conclusion, I think it was a powerhouse effort from Mark Frost. And once again, I'd highly recommend the final dossier for any fellow diehard fans of Twin Peaks. You won't be disappointed. The final dossier definitely succeeded in enhancing my overall Twin Peaks experience. And it answered a lot of questions while keeping the key mysteries alive and well with amplifying effect. Excellent stuff. There are a lot of other parts of the book I want to touch on in the near future, especially the fascinating stuff regarding Cooper's doppelganger, which I thought were very interesting and informative. But until then, thank you, Mark Frost, for making that itch even itchier than it already was, because I'm just itching for more Twin Peaks. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed, and have a great night.